questions that were not answered before. Zuma has been at the helm as South Africa's president for just under a decade. His tenure was marred with controversy, including corruption and fraud charges laid against him. Perhaps he might also use this platform to tell his side of the story, far from the courts of the law. You listen to Melo for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. You're watching Africa Live, still ahead on the program. British Prime Minister Theresa May to hold a Brexit deal vote in Parliament in the third week of January. And why a new discovery in Algeria could change the story of where humanoids originated from. You don't find the stories of North Africa by sitting on the sidelines. You've got to get out, go there and you'll find them in the bazaars of Casablanca. Among the crowds in Cairo, we want to visit Cairo, the ancient capital of Egypt. Along the waters of the Nile, along the sands of the Sahara, no one else will take you where we can in North Africa. No one else will show you what it's all about. CGTN, see the difference. My home country lies at the foot of Africa, the southernmost tip of our beautiful continent and the unique point at which two great oceans meet. Now on a clear day in Cape Town, you can just make out Robben Island, the place where Nelson Mandela was jailed for so long. South Africa has changed so much in the years since then, but it is this country's history that shaped me and took me into reporting. I'm inspired by Africa's men and women of courage. It's the everyday hero who brings out my passion. The creatives, the decision makers, the risk takers who are shaping a bright African future. I see them in Cape Town. I see them in the pulsating city of Johannesburg. I see them across the continent, and I know our time has come. CGTN is a platform where African voices can speak for themselves and take their stories to the world. My name is Lindim Tongana, and I'm a news anchor and reporter for CGTN. British Prime Minister Theresa May has rescheduled a delayed vote in Parliament on her Brexit plan to January. The statement came after Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn said his party would call a no-confidence vote in May, a largely symbolic move to step up pressure on the Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, at this council I faithfully and firmly reflected the concerns of this House over the Northern Ireland backstop. I explained that the assurances we had already agreed with the EU were insufficient for this House and we had to go further in showing that we never want to use this backstop, and if it is used, it must be a temporary arrangement. I know that this House is still deeply uncomfortable about the backstop, and I understand that, and I want to secure to us to go further still in the reassurances we secure. Discussions with my EU partners, including Presidents Tusk, Juncker and others, have shown that further clarification following the Council's conclusions is in fact possible. So discussions are continuing to explore further political and legal assurances. And we are also looking closely at new ways of empowering the House of Commons to ensure that any provision for a backstop has democratic legitimacy. So let's cross over to London now. CGTN Sir Richard Bestick is giving us more insight on the ongoing Brexit process. Uh, Richard, so a date has now been set for the Brexit deal to be put to a vote in Parliament. We've got that date uh, and it's got to be said that the fact that it's not until after Christmas has angered many MPs. Uh, the opposition leader Jeremy Corbyn said it was outrageous that yet another month had been lost. And it's got to be said that uh, 
during her hour and a half answering questions in the Houses of Parliament, uh, there was very little uh, support evident for uh, Theresa May's deal with the European Union or indeed um, the fact that uh, she was delaying it until the 21st of January. Uh, even those who did support her were alarmed that uh, it was uh, we were waiting so long for the vote to take place. They argued that it could easily take place uh, within, the next, uh, within the next few days that it, and that it should go ahead. Once it was cleared up, uh, th then the House of Commons in Parliament would know what uh, path to take forward. The reality is, you heard her there talking about returning from um, Brussels last Friday. The reality is, uh, not much has changed, and since she was uh, forced to withdraw the vote last week, uh, the anger. Uh, a barometer of the anger in Parliament at that decision uh, came with uh, members of her own party in Parliament uh, launching a leadership challenge to her. But there's very, very little evidence that uh, she's changed her position. She's still saying to Parliament, my deal, which again looks set to uh, be lost by a massive majority, my deal, says Theresa May, is the only deal on the table. The only other option uh, is no deal or indeed possibly no Brexit. Um, but she, the re she really is here playing a very dangerous game in the view of some of um, precipice politics because another month lost brings us even closer to that deadline of the 29th of March when Britain could, if only by accident, crash out of the European Union with no deal, no agreement whatsoever. And the Bank of England and the Treasury both say that would have huge economic consequences and would create business chaos. So on that uh, precipice of politics that you talk about there, Richard, what should we expect, though, ahead of that uh, critical vote in January? Well, over the weekend, it became evident that members of uh, Theresa May's own cabinet were plotting a path uh, with the opposition Labour Party to uh, organise a second Brexit referendum. In the Commons today, she set her heart against that completely. She ruled it out, saying it would create bad faith with the people, that um, it would undermine the democratic process. She really established that she had not changed that position. There was, for her, there is no moving towards uh, an opt-out, a path away from the logjam, the stalemate uh, that uh, the Houses of Parliament are currently in towards asking the people uh, whether they're happy uh, with the deal that's been drawn up or whether they'd be happy with no deal Brexit for that matter. Uh, so expect huge movements on the part of uh, not just uh, backbench MPs, not just the opposition uh, Labour Party, but um, by, from her own cabinet members, as, as everyone jockeys for position and tries to work out where to go if and when that uh, Brexit deal that Theresa May has negotiated with the EU, uh, if and when that's brought down, what options will be left? So that's what we'll see in the coming days, a massive uh, scrambling for some kind of alternative. And on that Brexit deal itself, Richard, either if it is adopted or rejected, what are the likely implications? Well, I think that's a good point. It's pro probably worth reminding ourselves, because we've been doing this for two and a half years, but it's probably worth reminding ourselves um, what Brexit is all about. We're talking about uh, the second largest economy in the European Union, which makes among the largest, after Germany, the largest contributions uh, to the EU's coffers, uh, pulling out after more than 40 years of membership. Uh, and let's not forget what it's, uh, Britain is pulling out of, the world's biggest, most powerful and richest trading bloc with uh, 
a uh, marketplace on Britain's doorstep of £500 million. It is quite the most extraordinary event in terms of business and, to, and in terms of politics and diplomacy. All right, uh, Richard Bestick for us there in London with our update on uh, Brexit. Now let's move on to Nigeria. A renewed wave of attacks by an ISIL-leaning faction of Boko Haram is becoming a major concern for leaders in the Chad Basin. The group has killed more than 100 Nigerian soldiers and continued to launch more deadly attacks on military installations across the northeast. CGTN's Elech Kelech Emekalam has more. Attacks on military installations have become more rampant in the northeast, the latest being the Gudumbali attack where 12 soldiers were reportedly killed. The military says only one was killed. The bloodiest attack in the last few months occurred in late November in Metele. About 100 soldiers were killed there. Boko Haram's offshoot, the Islamic State in West Africa, Iswa, has claimed responsibility for the attacks. The rise in attacks come on the back of reports that the group is being boosted by ISIL fighters from the Middle East. They have international support uh, from some of the terrorists. I was talking about um, Islamist or West African province that are helping in this fight. We have seen that they, they, they are part of the fight in the, in the northeast now. Because they have, if you see the tactics and everything has changed, it shows that they are, these are people that are war tested. They are fought in other places. President Buhari's government has been claiming Boko Haram is defeated. But the latest attacks has got him acknowledging the threat posed by the insurgents. He's now mobilizing regional leaders from the Chad Basin to form a common front against the group. Over the weekend, he met with presidents of Chad and Niger, among others. He wants them to make defeating Boko Haram a priority. Previous regional offensive against Boko Haram had paid off. The last one involving Nigeria, Chad and Niger is credited for dislodging the insurgents from their stronghold in Sambisa Forest. But the alliance soon disintegrated due to lack of funds. The international community must begin to think of giving us a better support like they have done in other places where they are fighting this kind of war. And when you look at the um, I think a publication that came up recently has given the uh, Boko Haram has been the third most deadly uh, yes. um, terrorist group. So you can, can, cannot continue look, seeing it as a Nigerian problem because it will affect everybody. ISIL in West African province is also reportedly beginning to gain territorial control around the Lake Chad Basin. In the past, the group has not only destabilized Nigeria, but neighboring countries like Cameroon, Chad and Niger have all suffered the effects of the bloody insurgency. Kelechia Mekalam, CGT and Abuja, Nigeria. Archaeologists in Algeria have discovered stone tools and cut animal bones that may be up to 2.4 million years old. This potentially is a, a serious challenge to East Africa's claim to be the cradle of mankind. Let's take a look. East Africa is widely considered to be the birthplace of stone tool used by ancient hominid ancestors. However, recently discovered artifacts in Algeria now throws into a spin the Cradle of Humanity title. Ancient tools were found in Setif, 300 kilometers east of Algiers. The tools closely resemble those called Oldowan, found until now mainly in East Africa. The discoveries were made in two layers. We are on the 1.9 million year old layer of the earth and there is another layer beneath it or an older layer estimated at 2.4 million years ago. Today, North Africa is also the second world site for the origins of humanity thanks to this important discovery. Algeria now brings a very important addition to the rewriting of the history of humanity in general. The tools were unearthed near dozens of fossilized animal bones which contained cut marks. 
The new findings make Ayn Boucheri the oldest site in Northern Africa with on-site evidence of hominid mutants often associated with stone tools. It is suggesting also that other similar early sites can be found outside the Eastern Africa Rift. These are the tools that were found in Algeria at the site of Ain Boucherit and date back to 2 million and 400,000 years. These tools are used to cut meat and crack bones so that prehistoric humans could consume these substances. However, no human remains were found. Until now, the oldest known tools from Northern Africa were 1.8 million years old and were found at a nearby site. Research teams will be expanded in Algeria to continue in the search for more discoveries in other historical periods. We will expand the number of research teams. We expect to achieve results older than 2.4 million years. But more important results and many secrets are yet to be discovered on this earth where we are now. The site of Ain Lachnek is the second oldest in the world after Ghana in Ethiopia. It goes back to 2.6 million years ago. It is widely considered to be the cradle of mankind. But from this finding, two case scenarios were concluded. Either early ancestors of modern day humans carried stone tools with them out of East Africa into other regions, or humanity is birthed from multiple origins. Alexandria Majala for CGTN. In Kenya, storytellers from across Africa came together in the country's capital, Nairobi. Through fables and uh, folk tales, they highlighted contemporary issues such as greed, war, nepotism, and the obsession with fame and materialism. Take a look. Tonight was the night of the feast. People from across Africa and beyond gather in large numbers here. Their aim is to keep alive a tradition they say is dying out. Africa has a rich history of storytelling. Knowledge and morals have mostly been transmitted through oral tradition and performances. Our pasts are important to me, our histories are important to me, um, and I kind of talked about that a bit in, in the story that I told on stage, that they connect us to our memories, our ancestry, our, and they guide us, you know, they teach us on how to live, how to be good people how to interact with other people, how to interact with the environment, um, what, how do we do any of these things. Stories are the ones that give us the guide, that anchor us. In the current generation, smartphones and other screen-based entertainment platforms are gaining more popularity than storytelling. According to Maimuna Jallo, television and social media are gradually taking over modern society. For this reason, she organized the two-day event, hoping to tackle some social issues shared across African societies. I started this journey about three years ago, and I traveled to various small villages to look for East African folk tales. And nearly everywhere I went, people had no recollection of their own stories. And the generation who used to tell these stories are now in their 80s. So for me, it was really important to see how do we preserve not only the stories, but in particular, the culture of telling stories orally. Because I think it's very different from watching a television program or reading a book. But to have that storyteller in front of you with an audience to be able to interact is something very precious that we're in danger of losing. The audience here got to enjoy a live performance from the traditional Kora or African harp player Sanjali Jobati, who hails from the Gambia. African harps have been used to keep alive oral histories in West Africa for over seven centuries. And that's the kind of longevity the organizers of this gathering are hoping to achieve. Terry Wangari, CGTN. Let's now take a look at Africa's business today with Ramanyang Rama. Thank you very much, Beatrice. Here's what's coming up in business. Fastjet has cancelled flight in Tanzania in response to a warning from the government there. And the findings of a probe into Steinhoff's accounts will be made public in February. 
Africa is the nexus of enterprise and global business will tell you why it matters. From the mega investment projects to multi-billion dollar mergers and acquisitions. Africa today collects just in terms of revenues from taxes alone $545 billion a year. If you take 10% of that and you devote it to the energy sector, problem solved. All this on Global Business, weekdays at this time on CGTN. Welcome back. Uh, troubled budget carrier Fastjet is our starting point for this segment. It's grounded all its flights in Tanzania after the Civil Aviation Authority over there cautioned it to streamline operations. Now remember, the carrier has been given 28 days to get its affairs in order or have its license over there revoked. The struggling Joburg-based air service cancelled its flight shortly thereafter and asked those affected to get in touch with its offices. The six-year-old carrier was set up with the aim of becoming Sub-Saharan Africa's first proper large-scale discount carrier along the lines of Ryanair, if you will, but it has struggled to turn a profit. Its CEO, in fact, is now warning of the closure, has warned around the closure of, of Tanzania's operations if shareholders don't pump in more cash. On to Angola now, it's developed a strategic plan that's designed to attract new players and fresh capital into its oil and gas sector. The country is targeting new players from within its borders and outside too for its 2019 licensing round. The Minister of Mineral Resources and Petroleum, Diamantino Zavedo, is keen to bring life to Angola's oil sector, which has seen a steep decline in discovered oil reserves and the maturing of the fields that are currently pumping oil. The new licensing round includes onshore and offshore blocks. It's expected to boost exploration potential. The ultimate aim is to increase production from the country's current level of just under 1.5 million barrels of crude per day. A much-anticipated forensic audit of one of South Africa's biggest corporate scandals is yet to be released. Steinhoff International, once the world's second-largest retailer, imploded a year ago when allegations of financial irregularities surfaced. The share price nosedived to virtually nothing. It's never recovered ever since. A report detailing the cause of the collapse is expected before the end of the year, but now it's going to come through in February, one hopes. Checking up the story, here's the GTN's Sumitra Naidu. It's been a year since allegations of accounting irregularities first surfaced against Steinhoff. Investors still don't have a definitive answer as to what happened and no one is being held accountable. There's several different investigations currently underway. The JSC2 is waiting to conclude its own investigation. What we do know is the, man, the amount is huge. It's 8 to 10 billion euro and it probably relates to goodwill, intangible asset values, inflating profits, inflating group valuations, but we don't know any of the detail yet and we don't know the full extent. The JSC's probe is also looking at possible insider trading after it emerged that disgraced CEO Marcus Euster allegedly alerted close associates to the impending crisis. The amount of money that could have been saved um, could have run into billions if people had been forewarned that the share price was about to crash. Um, so essentially, you know, not all investors would have had that pre-insider information, which is the whole reason why it is so illegal. So those special people would have been given special privilege to either, in this case, save the losses. Euster appeared before a parliamentary inquiry in September, where he dismissed the allegations of irregular accounting practices. Investors, though, are not willing to let this go. Ex-chairman Christoph Wieser, who is the largest shareholder in Steinhoff, is suing the retailer for more than $4 billion. So for Mr. Euster to claim that he was just a retailer and he didn't understand the gravitas of what was truly going on in this international organization is quite frankly bizarre. It's unacceptable. If you look strictly at the laws just of South Africa and if those laws are applied hopefully in the way that they ought to be applied, then he would be facing a very, very long jail sentence as well as his personal assets being stripped. South Africa state investment arm has also been dragged into the mess. The Public Investment Corporation manages $150 billion in assets, mostly pension funds. The PIC had between probably 3 to 6% Steinhoff exposure, same as everyone else, they've lost it. But the PIC also privately financed the BEE shares of Steinhoff. 
Now that will be a private company, it's not a listed company, and I think that's what the investigation is going to probably center on, is did they do their work correctly in giving these loans to the BEE partner? Some of Steinoff's international operations have already been sold off or restructured. The South African wing managed to escape the catastrophe just months earlier when it was unbundled in October 2017. Sumitra Nadu, CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa. Right, and one last story for you in this segment. Six aviation enthusiasts from China's Liaoning province have built a full-size replica of an Airbus A320. As CGTN's Guangyang reports, they spent over $400,000 in building this thing. If you can't afford to buy one, build it. This full-size replica of an Airbus 320 built by six farmers from Liaoning province has been a real buzz on the social media, even though it can never actually fly. I've already spent 2.7 million yuan from my savings on this. Zhu didn't finish middle school and started out farming onions and garlic before moving on to wedding work in a factory. The other five members of the group also helped on the project. At first, all they had to work on was a toy model. Then they started measuring the aircraft's dimensions and studying online photos. After weeks of trial and error, here it is. Initially, the six farmers only tried to build a house modeled on a commercial jet as a hobby. But the project grew to a full-size aircraft. Up till now, millions of yuan were invested simply because of the aviation dream they had since childhood. At first, my parents were totally against it. Some friends thought I must be out of my mind spending that amount of money on this. But I start to work. The plane's latest additions are a self-made cockpit and the stairs for getting aboard. Obviously, Mr. Drew's A320 cannot be flown, but the farmers have other plans. This is my dream, and I am realizing that. In terms of commercial purposes, we will probably open a restaurant or a hotel in the plane. China is trying to promote a spirit of innovation and creativity in this new era, where people are not afraid of being aspirational. As Zhu said, it's better to have an impossible dream than no dream at all. Guangyang, CGTN, Liaoning Province. Right, then I'll leave you there for the time being. I'll be back at the top of the hour, though. We'll be looking at inflation in Zimbabwe. It's hit levels we've not seen in 10 years at 31%. What does this mean for the economy? Where did this number come from? All that and more. We'll have some answers for you at 1800 GMT from Harare. See you then. For now, though, back to Beatrice. Rama, thank you. And we still have more news for you here on the program. Here's what's ahead. Local designers see changing fortunes after dressing up Beyonce and Jay-Z in their South Africa concert. Join us in global business in Sea Africa through our eyes. The greatest journeys. The greatest sights. The greatest adventures. Here in Panata, this weir allows the locals to walk on water. We're far more than just TV news. We're your passport to the wonders of Africa. to bring you stories of struggle, survival, and hope. Ah. Ah. So let's explore. CGTN, see the difference. A fashion label in South Africa got a major boost for being part of a lineup of designers to dress Beyonce at the Global Citizen Festival recently held in Johannesburg. Beyonce and her husband Jay-Z were the headline act for the concert, held in honor of Nelson Mandela's centenary year. CGTN's Julie Shire reports. Kiteria and George hit the South African fashion scene five years ago. Their haute couture designs have adorned local celebrities and graced catwalks all over the world. 
I'm obsessed with beautiful things. I love a beautiful dog. I love a beautiful woman. I love, I love a beautiful car. You know, I love a beautiful man. I love, I love beauty. You know, and for me, there has to be something luxurious about uh, life. We offer something different, something unique, which is um, an exaggerated luxury. The duo recently stole the headlines for designing Beyonce's final outfit for the Global Citizen Festival. She is the Michael Jackson of today. For her to, to work at Terra and George with all the big brands that were presented to her and she only chose about six. There was Versace, there was Balmain and there was only one African designer and that was us. It means that the sky's the limit. And I saw her and I was like, yes, it's our dress. But it's not like a, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Do you know what I mean? Because it, there was, I mean, she returned the, the, the piece maybe four or five times, I don't know. You know, to fix that, fix that, make it all. I feel like it's too tight to make it, you know, a little bit loose and stuff like that. So that whole process was even more exciting than seeing her on stage. For Kiteria and George, it's been an unexpected boom. It's been crazy since. Beyonce was singing guitar and George. Like we get messages every day, people wanting to to just be a part of guitar and George, just to get a blouse or just you know a shirt by guitar and George. So that exposure has translated into business. Wearing a Kiteria and George design is about feeling beautiful and looking glamorous. When you look closely at this garment, you see the love that goes into creating one of them. And Beyonce looked exquisite in her showstopper outfit. Julie Shire, CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa. And elsewhere in Cape Town, it was all about the hair. And there was quite a lot to see. The Natural Hair Fest showcased stunning natural hairstyles. It was the biggest independent natural hair event in the country. Attendees were treated to music, food and plenty of photo opportunities. The event was first created in December 2016 by Cape Town Naturally. To many people, non-functioning phones, damaged radios, personal computers and laptops need to be disposed of. But for one Ivorian artist, the electronic waste can be turned into intricate pieces of art. Take a look. In the heart of Abidjan, the commercial capital of Côte d'Ivoire, 24-year-old Desiree Kofi goes about his daily routine. He's in search of damaged and disposed of electronics, such as phones, radios, TVs, or even computers. These are the necessary ingredients for his mixed media artwork. From aesthetically recycling the e-waste he collects, he comes up with fine artistic pieces. The residents here help me a lot because when they have old phones or unusable phones, they call me to come and collect them. And that was not the case before because you would find these old phones in the drain or find children playing with them which is harmful to their health. Every part of the disposed electronic can become useful. At the moment, I'm working with phone screens and keyboards, and I will use the rest of them in my painting. I keep everything. I do not throw anything away. I store them, and I will use them later. Kofi is using his art to inspire positive social change. This is a follow-up to my series to save a child, and this is a portrait of a little girl who is showing her tongue, and I try to express her joy through the colors that I used. His former teacher and fellow artist acknowledges the uniqueness of his work. I think his work is great. He was one of the best students when we were in art school. Today, he has decided to go into recycling and it really suits him because his work stands out from all others. And I think that he's an artist with a lot of potential. Today we talk a lot about recycling and we like the type of work that he's doing. But also, at the back of that, you can get the graphic design aspect of his work. You can see that he is an artist who, despite incorporating recycling material into his work, he manages to capture all these forms, faces and emotions in his work, which really blew us away. Kofi's artworks fetch him at least $173 per piece. He's been able to hold several exhibitions locally and abroad. Kofi is fast becoming one of the most important figures in Côte d'Ivoire's contemporary art scene. Alexandria Majala for CGTN. All your sports news coming up next. Here's what's ahead.
There's renewed rivalry in the Champions League as the last 16 draw is made. Africa, where champions are made, records are broken, legends are born. We're there for every goal, for every knockout, for every step of the way. Match point only on CGTN.